so this is, uh, your film deals with all sorts of things that fascinate me. I'm, so, I'm almost the perfect audience member in the sense that uh, I'm a film fan, uh, first really? and foremost. <laughs> uh, and I'm also someone who's fascinated by the supernatural and belief and life's big questions and how these things impact art uh, and creativity in ge generally speaking. Um, what was your first experience with The Exorcist? How, how old were you when you encountered this movie? And had you seen, you know, in terms of context, other films yet that dealt with similar themes or, or even horror movies in general? What was your first encounter? Um, it, it actually came fairly late, uh, even though as, as a kid, I was an avid watcher of, um, of horror movies. Uh, the Exorcist came late because my, uh, my mother had had a traumatic experience mm. watching it. And, um, you know, she couldn't sleep for a week. It was just one wow. of those things. And so I, I really dreaded watching The Exorcist. So I waited a long time. I watched it in my 20s. Mm. Um, but as I, as I often say... Um, the for me the exorcist is um is is a profoundly moving piece of filmmaking when i watched it for the first time it didn't you know i i of course it's a horror film i'm not trying to get around that um but um but it's a film that has so much um beauty and love in it uh that i you know the more i think about the exorcist that this is what sort of sticks with me uh, hmm. And I think this is what makes it such a profoundly moving uh, piece of filmmaking. Yeah, um, I, I get the same sense from it. And it's interesting to me also that you didn't see it until you were an adult, uh, not only for the reasons you described, but also, you know, on a similar tack uh, for me, you know, I'm Generation X. And I grew up in the Midwest. And so my first real love of horror films was you know, the original Nightmare on Elm Street, which continues to be my favorite horror film. Oh, yeah. And, and then, of course, I, you know, as a middle schooler, went through the slasher genre and was really into Halloween and Friday the 13th and everything. Yeah. And films that are now not just favorite horror films of mine, but favorite films in general, like The Exorcist and The Shining, I didn't see, I think of those two movies in particular because I didn't see those until well into adulthood. And yet they were both films that the major beats, uh, the most famous scenes, different bits of dialogue, you know, that was all, I was aware of all of it. You know, I knew what The Exorcist was about. I knew what The Shining yeah. was about. I knew they were, I knew about the books they were based on. I knew who directed them, who wrote them, who starred in them. It was like somehow you absorb that before you actually see the film. And yeah. those are two movies. I bring them both up and compare them just in my own experience because regardless you know, oftentimes something's so built up that it's inevitably disappointing. It could never live up to, to all of that. And those were two films that when I finally saw them from start to finish as an adult, they not only lived up to the hype, so to speak, but exceeded my expectations. Yeah. And that's, uh, I mean, that's such a one in a million kind of thing. Well, with, you they're, they're, they're very rare films. I mean, it's, uh, you know, they're, I mean, films that become, essentially cultural events you know i mean mm. the, this is really what we're talking about here i mean i think even psycho you know like psycho yes. the, one, you know one thing that i think is remarkable is um uh, is that i mean obviously you know i've met a lot of people when i was touring with my film 7052 you know who who had never watched psycho right. but the they thing all knew the shower I, scene they all knew the they, twist they all knew, yeah yeah but 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 you know but so you had all these people who came, you know, 60 years after Psycho came out to watch a film about a scene from a movie <laughs> they had not even watched. Right. Right. I mean, let, let that sink in for a second. Yeah. Incredible stuff. Yeah. Not only that, but then I would ask, I would say, well, it, you know, for those of you who have never watched a film, if I tell you, can you think of the music in your head? Can you, you know, does it come to mind? And they're like, yeah. I mean, like, how remarkable is that? Like, yeah. if that's not, if that's not, you know, as you said, one in a million, so few movies become that. And I think those yeah. are truly cultural treasures, you know? I had a conversation recently with a friend of mine about how, you know, when, when Nicholson says, as Jack Torrance, here's Johnny, that was, of course, 
that, that, that was of course like a you know a major kind of pop culture reference at the time because every you know there were three channels and everyone knew the tonight show everyone knew johnny carson everyone knew ed mcmahon and that famous intro and i was struck by how now in 2020 here's johnny is probably more associated with the shining in in pop culture you know yeah. than, yeah. than yeah, with exactly. ed mcmahon and johnny carson and yeah. it's just wild to think about you know these films take on that sort of life and you know having covered other films that deal specifically with exorcisms uh, i mean the the exorcist looms so largely that i I, i've never had a conversation with a filmmaker with with anyone involved in any other film that even comes close to this territory without the exorcist coming up either in terms of how does this movie differ what do they have in common uh you know how much of an influence or how did you you know what did you have to shake off like it's it's just so omnipresent yeah. as the definitive well, film about this subject. Yeah, I mean, because it's it's really it it makes it really hard, I think, on the genre when, you know, when a subgenre in a way gets kicked off by the absolute mm. pinnacle of what this subgenre has to offer. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's yeah. it's again, it's like Psycho. Like I, I for me, like if you want to think about the the, the slasher genre subgenre of which I'm I'm not a te- I'm not a huge fan. Uh, I, I have to say, but it's like, I mean, Psycho, I'm a massive fan of, but yeah. I feel like there's Psycho and then like, where do you go from there? Like it's all, yeah. sort of, I mean, no matter how great, to me, it's all downhill from there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, you can't, there's nothing to say about that. You know, it's, it's, that doesn't mean people shouldn't keep trying to make those, you know, films in those subgenres. Sure. I mean, definitely I'm not trying to go there. But yeah, The Exorcist, like, how are you going to beat that? I, I don't think you can. Yeah. You, and it's funny because when the, the way that pop culture becomes currency and, and language and art in general and the way that it, it transcends and translates, I think for most people, especially in a more secularized age, like right now, if you talk about the concept of possession or yeah. even or demons or uh, or what are the rights of an exorcism by and large i think the association is going to be with this film that's going to be where people's yeah. you know basically much like uh i was talking about this with my kids the other day and my daughter was telling me how you know in one of her classes when they were talking about the greek gods and the roman gods and you know pretty much lack of familiarity and as soon as the Norse gods came up, everyone knew Thor and Loki and Odin. And the teacher was like, how do you guys know all this Norse mythology so well? And it's like, well, right, right. Marvel superhero movies. Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> and the exorcist has that same sort of um, currency in, in the conversation, sure. which is just remarkable about it. So one thing I'm, I'm dying to ask you is uh, you've said that you were offered carte blanche in terms of making this film and doing your six day interview. Yeah. I'd like to know what that conversation was like. <laughs> the conversation <laughs> where, <laughs> where you got free reign to, uh, you know, sit well, down with it, a master filmmaker and do whatever it, you want with it. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's not an overt conversation. Um, you know, it's, it's not like he said it that way, but the, so the way it happened was, um, you know, you can call it, serendipity you can call it fate whatever you want to call it but i was um i was at the sigis film festival uh, i was touring with 1752 in 2017 and he was there getting his lifetime achievement award and um i was having lunch in one of the many possible restaurants there on the port one day and and then he was two tables behind me and called me to his table because he had heard a lot about 1752 and he says i want to you know he says i want to come he said come over here i want to tell you some stories about hitch oh, wow. you know <laughs> Yeah. I mean, how cool is that, right? So, yeah. so there I go, and you know, we join his table, and and um, and then he takes my phone, and then he gives me his email address and his phone number, and he says, uh, "Send me your film right away." I'm like, okay, great. So I send him the film, and then you know, a few hours later, I get this wonderful email. I absolutely loved 1752, and he says, "You know, ne- next time you're in LA, call me. I want to buy you lunch." I'm like, okay, great. Yeah, so, I, think I, I think I can do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me check my book, <laughs> you know. And, um, and so, so we're having lunch in LA three weeks later, basically. And, and, um, and then the conversation 
uh, basically shifted very quickly to the exorcist mm. and um and then he started telling me about you know his archives and and his collections and whatever and and, uh, and then he said you know if you wanted access i'd give you access and i'm like uh, okay what, what do you mean he said well you know read my autobiography and if you find an angle just let me know wow and so that's you know that was his invitation you know he he threw the bait i took the bait obviously <laughs> obviously <laughs> um and and um and at that point what was really quite remarkable so then i i told him i said i, I told him exactly how i wanted to approach it and i told him that i wanted this to be a one-on-one i wanted this to be about his process i told him that i wanted to essentially use the the hitchcock truffaut model of interviews yeah but instead of chronologically going over his entire filmography i only wanted to focus on the exorcist i wanted to completely crack it open every sequence every scene every technique every influence every you know and over a period of days and i said you know and and so he came back to me and he said well that sounds wonderfully ambitious how many days do you need you know so <laughs> i said look um i said let's start with three you know and um and i thought that cover it in three but you know it took took six days ultimately to and you know you, you never cover it like i did there's still right. so much still to, so much to talk about to, yeah to talk about you know like that's the thing yeah. um but that's but, how i feel walking away from a great interview it's like man we could you know we could keep going for hours and hours so that that's yeah. that's a good feeling to have Oh, the worst, sure. the worst yeah. is a conversation where you're like, well, we're done. And we still yeah, like, what else do I have? <laughs> oh, yeah, there's this question I forgot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, but it's, but so, so, you know, what a blessing. I mean, you know, but, but so at that, at that moment, um, he completely, you know, he never once asked um, to, you know, what I was doing, how I was approaching it. He never questioned anything. Mm. Uh, just a couple of times he said, you know, are you sure you don't want to talk to, you know, Alan Burstyn or Mike Fonsita or what, you know, and of course, like inside it was like, oh gosh, I would love to meet them so much, but no, <laughs> you <Right>. know, <laughs> I was like, I'm like, I'm like, no, Billy, like, yeah. this is really, this is, this is the perspective. This is the, I'm going to stick to this. And he never questioned it. And he, in fact, he never, when, you know, when the film was, was you know, when we had a fine cut and he knew that I had sent it to Venice um, he didn't even want us to watch it at that point. Like even, mm. even when the film got into Venice for the world premiere, he didn't even have to watch it. At that point, he said, I want to experience it in front of an audience and wow. I want to be in Venice for the world premiere. Wow. Like that's how much trust he put into me. I mean, yeah. to talk about pressure, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, imagine. Not only is it the first time that that film festival audience is seeing it, it's the Ooh. first time that the subject of the movie is seeing it. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so what happened very sadly, very unfortunately, is he actually couldn't make it to Venice because he he got um, he had a lot of health issues last year. Yeah. And so a few days before, and it was all planned. He was planning. He was going there, and you know everything was booked and. But he emailed me a few days earlier and he said, you know, like, I, I, I'm not going to be able to make it. Can you please send me a link? And that was like some, at like 10.30 PM, you know? So I said, of course, and I was, of course I was devastated, you know, that he wasn't yeah. going to be able to, you know? So I sent him the link and, um, and he, and at 2 AM, I get this email from him. And I, you know, I'll never forget It's this absolutely, I mean, he basically said, you know, um, trying to remember his words it was like uh, dear alexander i i have no words to express how overwhelmed i am with your mm -hmm. film you've made me a better person than i am and that's what he said and um you know he just kept going on and on about how proud he was and i mean i was crying like a i was like a, he turned me into an absolute puddle i mean to get a, a letter like this from you know the subject of any documentary means mm, sure. everything. but you get a something like this from from Friedkin, it's like you know like yeah <laughs> yeah, when you, if, yeah yeah exactly like you said for many for many subject when that yeah. feels like you captured them you know accurately and and uh yeah put it across the way that they would want to be presented but then for someone like him especially sure. and someone like him who uh one might say works in the same medium <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know it's not like you're doing a documentary on yeah yeah, yeah. you know, know. A cartoonist know. or something you know, i know and he's been you know i mean look he's he you know he has been such a obviously a mentor but a champion of my films i mean he's watched you know all my all my films and i send him stuff and he just uh, you know genuinely really really likes what i do and it's just um it's such an incredible um 
you know, feeling and not that I need the validation, but you know, yeah. well, everybody needs validation and, and, you know, and there's always people who don't like my films and that's fine. You know, like you're never going to please everybody no matter what you do, but, but it's really wonderful that, that we have that sort of connection and that he, he understands what I'm trying to do with my films and that he appreciates them. You know, that, that means everything. Yeah. And I, I have a, f- a bunch more uh, specific things I want to dive into about this particular film. But one thing I did want to ask you almost from a more sort of macro perspective, you know, we were talking about subgenres earlier and having a film that kicks off subgenres. Yeah. I love that you are working in this space of uh, specificity because a film like The Exorcist is so important and is so masterfully made and has such lore and, and stories behind it and, and meaning to it and layers, like you said, beyond even what, what appears on the surface that it invites that kind of study and there are you know like psycho there are you know there are these works of art that do and i love that you've zeroed in on this uh and and that we exist at a a point in history where this is possible where you can make a film like this (laughs) that's just like this laser focused study on something great picking it apart they're hard to finance Uh, yeah that's what makes me sad is it's uh, it's I, I feel like I'm and not just me, but my company, you know, exhibited pictures and my producer, Carrie, and we, we feel constantly like like a bunch of salmon just going up the current. And we're, you know, because yeah. we, we are really yeah. we, we make we're making those films completely against the trends and completely against this idea of a word that I absolutely have come to despise, which is content. You know, <laughs> right. we're talking about we're talking about movies about as content now. And you're, you're talking about these filmmakers literally dumping stuff into the bin of streamers, which look, I, I'm not um, going on a rant against streamers. Um, no, I get exactly what you mean. But you know what I mean? Like no. it's, it's, it's you, can't, you can't think of it in those terms. It's, it becomes really, really dangerous and really detrimental, you know, I think to, to, to the art form. And so, yeah, I think making those deep dives um, are, they're very difficult. And so I really appreciate your words. It means a lot. And I, and the thing that, that it, to me is really interesting too, is because I, I get to experience them. I, I have now for many years in front of crowds from around the world and, you know, but people really eat them up. And I think that there is this strange sort of disconnect between what people really appreciate and want mm-hmm. And then people who finance films, you know, like it's really, you know, it shouldn't be this difficult to finance something like this. Yeah. But it is. You know? Yeah. And, and it's, especially when you, it seems that the, the gatekeepers and the powers that be in recent years have realized that there is a broader, that everything has a home, right? That it went yeah. from growing up with three or four TV channels to now there's like seven channels just about cooking or whatever, you know, like there's the whole idea of, of niche and that, you know, there's these different buckets that things can go in. It's like, of course there's an audience for a film like this. Oh, for sure. You know? Well, and, and look, I mean, I'm, I'm very grateful that, you know, Shutter recognized that and, uh, you know, they were clearly the right partner for this. And, and um, I know, I know how much they like the film and they've been, uh, they've been pushing it. And I really hope that people, will um embrace it and watch it and and spread the word because that's how it happens you know yeah of course uh so i want to talk about your experience uh, in preparation spending a month 30 days uh with the exorcist yeah um describe that for me like you know where were you what was your setup what was your process of yeah. You know, did you focus on different chunks for different days at a time or what how does you know how does one go about watching The Exorcist for a month. <laughs> <laughs> and not go crazy, right? And not, yeah, yeah. and not go, not become possessed. <laughs> and not become possessed. Um, well, although I, I, I will say that I started having some pretty weird dreams. Oh gosh, I can only imagine. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was pretty intense. But I, uh, no, I very deliberately, uh, I was very deliberate about my choice because I, I, because I travel a lot. Um, I, you know, I get to pick my Airbnbs. And, um, and so I, I picked an Airbnb in, Seba- well, in Se- specifically in Sebastopol, California, which is right next to Bodega. And, um, you know, Bodega is, of course, where um, Hitchcock shot the birds. And so uh, I wanted to find an idyllic... Uh, if, I, if, I could, if, I could, uh, if I could 
turn my entire iMac around without knocking over everything on my desk. Uh-huh. I would show you the framed uh, birds poster. That's ooh. But anyways, nice. well, continue. So you know, you're going <laughs> to like, like the story because what I so what I did is so I I wanted to to find a place that was you know obviously beautiful and idyllic and that was going to sort of counterbalance the intensity mm-hmm. of the exercise. I felt like for my own sanity that was like essential. Um, and so my routine was every morning I would wake up at 5 30 in the morning and there was you know, there's usually fog there so I would, I would drive in the fog uh, right by the Potter School uh, you know which is really cool and I would sort of tip my hat to to hitch mm-hmm. <laughs> as a little sort of you know routine and mm-hmm. I'd go to the beach I'd go for like an hour and a half long walk and just breathe the the, the sea air then on my drive back, stop at a little coffee shop, get my coffee, go to my Airbnb with a view on a vineyard and watch The Exorcist. Mm-hmm. And so, and, and I would let it wash over me every morning. Uh, I would, of course, take notes every time, you know, something happened. But, but I would start paying attention to different things. And mm-hmm. I would sort of let the film kind of um, show me what it wanted to show me that day. And then, and then I would start adding that to my book. And then the rest of the day, the afternoon, I would essentially, um, you know, work on, uh, you know, my interview questions, but also start organizing them into folders, into themes, into interview sessions, and start really structuring not just the the film itself, leap of what would become leap of faith, but also my own interview process mm-hmm. that was going to be that. And so that's. And every day, every day I would see something new. Every day new things would come to the surface, new sounds, new, you know, shots, new yeah. things. And, um, uh, you know, I could still be doing the same thing every day and I would still find new things every day. There's no question about Again, it. Again, and that's why that's what, uh, why a movie like that begs and invites so much study and conversation. It's amazing. No uh, how hard was it to resist the temptation to watch different cuts of the movie during those 30 days? Well, I I, uh, I think I watched once the quote unquote version you've never seen during those thirty days, um, but I really stuck with the original um, because, um, well, for me, you know, that's for me really it's it's the version, you know, mm-hmm. um, and you know, there's a reason why they don't call it the director's cut. It's the, it's not the director's cut. It's yeah, it's probably more. I mean, you know, Friedkin will say that he likes them both equally, and that's probably true. Um, <clears throat> but I think, I think the version you've never seen is probably more Blatty's cut than mm. it is uh, Friedkin's. I mean, he really reintroduced elements that Blatty felt were missing from the original, and so that's that's what it is. But I, yeah, I think the original for me is is where it's at. Yeah, when you meet someone who's never watched Blade Runner, like I don't even know what to tell them. <laughs> 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 Which one? I noticed there's a few different ones. What should I watch? It's yeah, like, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> I know, I know. It's, you know, but it's it's great that they all exist on a you know yeah. on a disc. You know, and I think that's yeah. W- without opening another can of worms, so that's something that Mr. George Lucas wouldn't wouldn't do, right? Yeah, one. there. You know, and it, and it, <laughs> and there and there are some. I mean, because he was tinkering with those, he was tinkering with the first one when it was even still in theaters. It gets back to that whole question of art too, where it's like, yeah. you know, when you're, I, I think about this in, the, in another documentary about Metallica, some kind of monster. There's a part where Lars Ulrich is talking about his art collection and he, he's staring up at this painting and he's, and he's wondering, you know, when did the painter know that they were finished? Like, yeah. this is the last brush stroke. Now this is done. You know, and he was, of course, relating it to his own career. Like, when is a song finished? When are we done tinkering with this song? And uh, yeah, it, it, and Lucas is is interesting because, uh, yeah, as much as there is a clamor for the very original theatrical versions, in his mind, it's like they're living <laughs> works, you know? <laughs> they're like constantly evolving. Yeah, like, and I mean, like... It, for I better mean, or it, worse. Yeah. yeah, I mean, which, which special edition is really the definitive version at this point? Right. Like is it the last one he's done or is like, is he going to keep changing his mind about things? Like, yeah, you know, it was Han who shot first. No, it was Greedo. No, no, they shot together. Like, I'm like, well, wait a minute. What is it going to be yeah. next? Like, like some yeah. other dude is going to show up and kill them both. Like, yeah. I mean, anyway, some, some, uh, uh this whimsical creature will probably show up and probably you know, that would grab, make- eat some food off their table or something. Um, sense, yeah. 
Yeah, and you know, I do enjoy these curiosities that come out, you know, because for years hearing about or reading about rather the behind the scenes drama on Superman 2. And mm-hmm. and then when that Richard Donner cut came right. out decades later, I mean, I was fascinated by it and it's kind of far superior, but it's also sort of you know, they used they ended up using the original Superman 2 ending in Superman 1. So when you see the Donner cut now, they both have the same ending, which is <laughs> yeah, Superman it. spinning the world backwards. But it, but it is, uh, yeah, it's hard to, once something is out there theatrically, like that's kind of, mm-hmm. and, and a movie really catches on. That is really the definitive one, despite, I mean, you know, it's the same thing again to, to liken it to music. Uh, there was a lot of conversation when Metallica did an anniversary edition of And Justice For All the, the mm. bass is kind of famously absent from the mix on that album. And there was a lot of talk about, oh, okay, are they going to remix it and remaster? We're finally going to hear the bass. And then even the guy who played bass on the album said, no, we're not going to do that. Um, mm. This record's been heard this way and all around the world for decades. And despite mm. any misgivings or criticisms or wish we could have done this differently, it needs to, remain pure in the way that it that it was released so yeah i think films are are very similar you know it's it's, it's always interesting for the conversation but uh yeah it's like the that theatrical is that's just it that's the one we well, all saw interesting, you know you also have this um i, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, website fanedit.org <laughs> yes <laughs> Um, yeah. which is really fascinating i don't i don't you know like i don't um i really have zero objections to filmmakers revisiting their films making changes or even fans playing in that sandbox for that matter um but as long as we do recognize that we need to preserve the original yes. that's it that's really what it comes down to like i have i don't mind at all george lucas making multiple special editions uh even if i don't like them but the fact that he has been vocal about wanting to destroy you know um the the original the you know the quote-unquote oot Mm -hmm. um is um that's very disturbing to me because it's it's not just i mean you know then there's this whole thing that it's it's a film that was uh, inducted into the library of congress Mm -hmm. and that's all from registry so does it belong to him legally sure but it also you can also make the argument that that morally belongs to all of it us. It belongs to us, yeah. I mean, with the, it's cultural and historical significance. I mean, absolutely, absolutely. And it's almost a form of self censorship in a way, because yeah, it's you know, if, if you're thinking about like Huckleberry Finn or something, it's like, well, would you want an edition of that that's censored? Uh, yeah, it gets into a whole a whole conversation. Yeah, right, 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 right. Exactly. Yeah. It's like the original. But it's I mean, history, it's you know. Yeah. Well, right. I mean, even Disney, uh, look, I mean, all these films that, you know, we can look at now and say, or these, you know, short animated films that, yeah, they were overtly racist. Don't erase them. Mm-hmm. Make them available with a con- with context, with context yeah. right? Because that's how we move forward as human, uh, as human beings. That, yeah. that, that's it. But don't Absolutely. destroy them. Don't, throw, don't, don't yeah. just like, pretend they never existed. Yeah, they did. They did. Yeah, and 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 in a lesser extent, something like Star Wars is uh, analogous because you could say, "Look, put this in the context of this isn't the filmmaker's complete vision. He felt restrained by budget for this and that, and later he went back and he was able to sweeten up this scene and make this sure. more continuity with the other movies and whatever. Give that context and then say, but here is the original version that made all this history. That, that yeah, yeah, I totally, totally with you, hundred um, percent." So I, going back to this idea of the, um, you know, the Hitch, the famous Hitch interview model that you had for this picture, uh, what, what were some of the things that surprised you the most, you know, in having these conversations, like moments where, where uh, you kind of sat up in your chair and went, oh, this is, this is going on in the movie. I've never heard well, him say I this mean, before. <laughs> I mean, you know, one, one word, Kyoto, you know, and, and for those of you, you know, people who have not watched Leap of Faith, then they got to watch it to understand what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. You know, um, that that completely um, that was a game changer. It was a game changer yeah. because it was um, it was a, very clearly a William Friedkin that you know um, 
none of us film fans had seen before, I think. And, um, and it just opened up a whole other sort of level and layer and of possibilities for me to uh, approach this film. So that, um, that was really the moment, I think, that, that changed everything. Yeah. And what was your personal relationship to, you know, because obviously The, the Exorcist is worthy of, of so much study and consideration as a film for its cinematic importance and mastery. Yeah. But in terms of like the themes that, that the film deals with and Friedkin's obsessions and relationship to all that sort of stuff, what was kind of, where were you coming from on that? Was that a big part of the interest initially and in delving into this? I mean, even in those, uh, that first personal one-on-one -on -one conversation prior to this even being a film, when you're like, I want to ask him about The Exorcist. Was, was that the stuff you wanted to know about? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that the, for me, thematically, what, what came to the surface, um, which of course he articulated, uh, and which I think is very foundational, not just to The Exorcist, but to, to his filmmaking, uh, is the ideas of faith and fate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and the mysteries, you know, the, this idea that, that we don't know anything. You know, I mean, he is, uh, he, 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 I think he is as much in love with the mysteries of life as, as, as I am. And I think we very much connect on that, on that front. I mean, I think, I think, you know, in retrospect, you know, because obviously this all happened very quickly, you know, as obviously he's a very instinctive filmmaker. Why did he just pick me out of a hat, you know, whatever. But I think he, it was a nonverbal thing. And I think, you know, now that I think back, that I can reflect back on, you know, the way that we connected the conversations that we had or whatever, I think philosophically we're very aligned. There's no question about it. I mean, I think when he talks about grace notes, when he talks about simplicity, when he talks about, you know, paying attention to the small things in life, all of that stuff, like that's, that's, I, that's stuff I've been interested in since I was a kid, you know? Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, I, I think it, like the whole process, like I said, I can look at it as ser completely serendipitous, but I can also look at it as it was sort of meant to be, you know, it was, mm -hmm. it was maybe fate. It was just like this film. Um, I, I, I wasn't just at sitting at that restaurant and suggest at that time uh, for no good reason. I mm -hmm. think it, it just had to be, you know, I don't know. Yeah. And it feels like one of those endeavors that you're sort of, uh, allowing it entry into existence more, almost yeah. more than, you know, create, you know, like that Michelangelo idea that like he sees this lab of marble and he sees the, mm -hmm. he sees the statue inside and he's just got to peel yeah. away to get to it, you know? Yeah. And well, to bring us full circle as we, as we wrap up, all right, I'm the, I'm the perfect audience for this film for all the reasons you said, because uh, the way that he articulates his worldview, so to speak, uh, is very great. much in line with uh, with who I am and where I'm at. So, thank you. Well, thanks for you know spreading the word. You know, that's happy uh, to. Ho hopefully, hopefully people will will give it a chance and will want to will want to spread the word themselves. I'm, I mean, I'm very proud of the film, and I know Freakin obviously is uh, very proud of it in, himself. And uh, yeah. hopefully, it'll be a you know a, a good success for for Shutter. Yeah, and I am a, a big advocate and champion for more of these from you and others of these deep dive type documentaries on this stuff. Well, I hope, I hope, so cool. uh, I hope some, some financiers are listening. <laughs> yeah, indeed. And then you can give them my phone number cause uh, you know, that'd be great. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thanks so much. I appreciate you taking the time to talk. My to pleasure. Me. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.